NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone doing tonight? <laughs> well, as always, thank you very, very much for coming out to join us tonight. Tonight, as NASA celebrates its 60th anniversary this year, we will be discussing how robots have played an integral part in space exploration. From America's very first satellite, Explorer 1, to two tiny CubeSats currently on their way to Mars, all built right here at JPL. The first of two panels will focus on major milestones in robotic exploration, what it took to reach those accomplishments, how far we've come, and how spacecraft have changed over the years. The second panel will focus on robotic spacecraft developments we might expect to see in the next couple decades, and what different demands we will be placing on those spacecraft as we look to explore new worlds. So ladies and gentlemen, to host our panel tonight, please help me welcome JPL Public Outreach Specialist, Mr. Preston Dykes. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, we're here to celebrate a birthday. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration is turning 60 this year. Uh, NASA began operations on October 1st, 1958. Now, there are a lot of incredible accomplishments we could celebrate in NASA's history, but our program tonight is to celebrate the role of the robots. That is, the robotic or automated spacecraft that we send on uncrewed missions, that is, without people on board, to study our home planet and to explore our solar system and beyond. Now, automated spacecraft extend our senses. Robots go where humans can't go, or can't go because it's too risky, or can't go yet. And uh, robots don't have to come back, although occasionally a few of them do. Um, in the first part of our show, we'll hit a few of the, the milestones in uh, robotic exploration and reflect on how far we've come. And uh, join us for the second part as well, where we'll take a look forward. So to get started, uh, let's, be, we'll, let's bring on a couple of engineers here who have had their hands in a slew of different robotic missions over the years. Please welcome Julie Webster and Rob Manning. Welcome, guys. Well, so uh, let me introduce you here. Uh, Julie Webster began her career uh, with NASA in 1987 and has worked on missions to Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. She was the spacecraft operations manager on the Cassini mission to Saturn and now serves as chief engineer on the Juno mission, which is orbiting Jupiter. Rob Manning currently serves as the chief engineer here at NASA JPL, and he's worked on most JPL Mars missions since the 1990s. Uh, and he was a key member of the team that landed the first rover on Mars. So thank you both for being here. Um, so can you, just to get us started, can you put into perspective what it's actually like to control a robotic spacecraft that's millions of miles away, and you, you know, you, you'll never see it or touch it again after it leaves the Earth, and you're remotely operating this thing. What, what is the task of operating that thing actually like? Go ahead. Well, there's two things. The first thing you got to do is you've got to anticipate everything in advance. So you try to remember to catch all of the stuff so you can know. It's like a good lawyer. You never ask a question that you don't know the answer to <laughs> until you get surprised. And, and the second thing is, and, and Rob and I talked about this before the show, we were talking about um, that it's like your grandmother is writing a letter. You know, everybody these days wants a text, and if 30 seconds later somebody hasn't answered your text, where are you? Where are you? And when th that works for the first few thousands or tens of thousands of miles away from the Earth, but after that, you have to wait for it. And by the time you get to Mars, it's 15, 20 minutes. By the time you get to Jupiter, it's 45 minutes to get there, and then 90 minutes round trip light time. And then it's three hours at Saturn, so you, you, there's no instant communication. Denma, I love it. 
Vermont. Yeah, so it might, yeah. My, my, my grandma did the same thing. It's just, it, <laughs> the letters get free, fewer and fewer uh, uh, spaced further and further apart. And so it is kind of strange. It is, and imagine, it is weird to see stuff that you've touched here on Earth and then gradually have it feel like it's getting further and further away. And, and the weirdest thing to see stuff that your vehicle does so far away does, it does what we ask it to. It's kind of strange. It does feel, it feels like it's, oh, it's, it, it's, it's a weird split between, I, I feel my brain is split between feeling I've created, we've created a robot that does our bidding and, or versus actually, as Preston said, a kind of extension of our bodies out there and our minds. But, uh, but these things are not, comp you know, we design them ourselves, but you know, it's remarkable how much they take a life of their own. Well, they develop their own personalities, don't they? They do. But it's, but it's mostly the quirks. It's the things that yeah. you don't anticipate that, that's how they develop their personalities. It's like um, you, you can build identical spacecraft, and yet once you send them out there, this one will have a wire that didn't go right, or this one will have that got, that got hot. And, and so they, their personalities are really kind of their... Works. Works. Yeah, somewhere between uh, R two D two and Hell nine thousand. <laughs> and so, I'm sorry, Rob. I'm afraid I can't do that. I've actually had, I've had, had a robot. Uh, I mean, a curiosity did to us once. So it's not a very good day. Well, you guys could yeah. both could both speak to the the, the task of, of the or the process, I guess, of planning each day's operations for a spacecraft, right? I mean, because in some respects, it's not really a technological task. Is it? It's a really it's a human, human, it's a human process. And the, and the further your spacecraft goes out, the longer you have to plan for it in advance. And uh, I, I never worked a tactical mission where you got the data and turned it around and worked next day. But um, like the sequences that we built on Cassini were designed years in advance, were finalized and sent up for 10 weeks at a time. So you had to you had to think ahead and know where your spacecraft was going to be or supposed to be at every second along the way. So those pictures, the, the, uh, the, the Cassini project to me has created some of the most spectacular space photography. And and sometimes the, I, I don't know how you figured this out in advance, but he created these visualize where uh, Deimos will be or, or with respect to the rings and... Uh, or, and uh, wrong, uh, wrong planet. Wrong planet, wrong planet. Wrong planet. <laughs> yeah, they all look alike to me. No, Titan, no Titan's over Titan. there. Uh, uh, you can see, you can see, the, you can, you can see things before, between its rings. You see the shepherd moons right there. Yeah. It, it the, but it all has to have been worked out way in advance. Way in advance. And, and the uncertainty of the timing you, you get better, and then sometimes you find yourself a few, a few seconds to maybe even minutes off, and you allow dead time so that you can move it at the last second as you get better and better knowledge. So it's like, it's, it's like clockwork. It's like a very it's, precise It's a very, time, exactly. it's like choreography. Yeah. You know? well, that's really the essence of a robot, right? You tell it, here's a sequence of things I want you to do, and it hopefully does, yeah. it. does it. What you don't want to do is, is to do something you didn't ask it to do, which and is how they develop their personalities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <there we> go. <laughs> well, let's let's take a look back uh, now at uh, some of the at some of the greatest hits uh, <laughs> that are playing on some phones here. Um, <laughs> let's take a look back uh, at, at some of the early milestones of robotic exploration, um, starting in December 1962, as the Mariner 2 spacecraft was approaching Venus for NASA's first flyby of another planet. Here's a video. In December, Mariner 2 was closing in fast on Venus, but it was in a precarious state. Portions of the spacecraft were overheating. Several critical telemetry sensors had stopped working altogether. It was taking all the energy the solar panels could produce to keep the spacecraft functioning. On December 14th, Mariner 2 made its closest approach to Venus, flying by at a distance of 20,000 miles. In Pasadena, a steady stream of science data came pouring back as audible sounds throughout mission control. Scientists were elated, although most of the results were more confirmations than new discoveries. There was no onboard camera, so there were no pictures. There was also no sign of a magnetic field or a radiation belt like Earth's. For a planet considered Earth's twin for its size and near proximity, 
Venus revealed itself to be a hellish world filled with carbon dioxide and where surface temperatures are hot enough to melt lead. 20 days after passing Venus, Mariner 2 transmitted half an hour of telemetry and then went silent. So Mariner 2 made it to Venus. Uh, <laughs> and, and it gave it NASA its first first in space, but it was dicey, and the spacecraft didn't last uh, long after. So I wonder if you guys could talk about what it takes to keep a spacecraft going for months or years, for long enough to complete its mission, uh, and, and what's changed over time that's made spacecraft more reliable? Well, yeah, the, a lot of it is understanding the space environment having an idea how things work that cold. Uh, you heard the re reference to the, the thermal, that things were too hot, things were too cold. And that's been the bane of a lot of spacecraft, is, is the, the thermal environment, the radiation environment, the, the understanding space. So as we've gotten better with understanding space and how hot it can be if you're facing the sun and how cold it can be if you're not, um, that's a lot of it. Right. I mean, we, uh, you think about stuff that we humans make on this planet, it, it's mostly stuff around room temperature, maybe a little colder, a little warmer in an atmosphere. Uh, it's, it, you know, if you're facing a heat source, the heat will radiate away, but also there's atmosphere cooling it down. But in space, with no air, uh, the, the sun just bakes one side, thousands of degree temperatures if you don't have some way to get the heat off. And then the back side that looks at deep space is looking at the residual microwave background radiation from the Big Bang at a little, a little below three degrees Kelvin, three, de three degrees above absolute zero. So it's like a super weird place. I mean, this is just, this is not how we live here in this planet. And, you know, and taking, you know, try that, try taking your television, put it in outer space. It just wouldn't last. And then not to mention the other things that we've discovered after, after Mariner 2 about the radiation effects. Oh, my goodness. All the radiation effects. And, and just tracking the spacecraft, just trying to stay in communication with it. You know, as you walk, if you've ever been separated by walkie-talkies, and the further you got or the, you got behind a tree, and all of a sudden you're not, you're not uh, texting or calling back and forth. So learning how to talk and to, to capture it as the Doppler shifted the radio signal and things like that, all of that was new. So yeah. and we've, we've learned more as we've gone on. Yeah. And, yeah. Deeps, and, and there are people that work Earth missions today still don't understand how different deep space is. Yeah, and, and, and just, just figure out where your spacecraft is in outer space. Uh, you know, it's uh, it sounds as if, you know, in, 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 Cassini can actually look out its window could. and see... Past could. Tense. Could. Uh, Past yeah. tense. Could. Yeah. Could. Oh. Oh. I miss Cassini. Hard for me, too. Yeah, I know. Uh, so it, it could look out its window and see the moons and kind of... We can sort of figure out from the pictures, but most of our spacecraft, if you look out, you just see a bunch of stars in the sun. You don't know where it is. And so we have to figure out where our spacecraft are from this planet uh, by coming up with these wild tricks using radio signals to bounce a beam back, back a little, back send a forth. boop, send a boop, and have a have that boop reflected off of the radio like a mirror, bounce back, and if you time it, well, and, and you, you have can figure to, it out and, how far and inertial radiation, inertial gyros, gyros and things like that that gyros. you have to to first learn um, what. The programmer, did they put it in oh, yeah. J2000 or, or 1958 yeah. terms or XYZ? What programming language did they what use? What programming right? language and, did and they the use? the spacecraft had no computers. Had no computers. Fact, or they had analog computers. And, 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 and barely at that. It was mostly mm. just, uh, just closed-loop controllers. Closed-loop controllers. Kind of an exotic uh, toaster ovens. Um, <laughs> uh, not, not to knock it. Um, uh, even, even Voyager had very rudimentary logic for controlling it. In fact, most of our spacecraft didn't know where they were in outer space, and, or even knew its orientation, let alone where its position. Um, but it did know that there was a bright star over there, and if it, if it moved too far away from it, the sensor would complain. Would complain. And that's all it needed to do. And so, uh, 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 so it was very simple. And we also important out that these vehicles back then, and, and, and Eli, Eli, up until Cassini, which was one among the first, they were all built by hand. These vehicles were designed and built. We didn't use computers. Lots of big blueprints, pencils. Lots of blueprints. Um, still getting rid of and, and hand, just hand soldered electronics uh, with, with sometimes with, the, with the, just individual wires from a blueprint, trying to make sure that the design is built like the blueprint. 
And that's how it was done uh, for years and years. Can you imagine how easy it was to make a mistake with thousands of uh, uh, th hundreds, uh, th hundreds of thousands of feet, sometimes or, or of wires, the, or the bane of my existence, where you had to rework it when you had to pull off a circuit and rework oh. it, and you hoped you got all the solder out, and yeah. if you didn't get all the solder out, you, you know, and the, yeah, then you, you and then you worry, you know, anybody that's ever worked on cars. So I mean, so obviously we've come a long way, and you guys no longer have to get your hands dirty with solder on them. I know. Right. <laughs> so let, they, they didn't let us do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They let me do so, it once. No. So, so, it. <laughs> so we, we, let's move move forward in time to uh, to the next mi major milestone, which is once we succeeded in just reaching another planet, uh, the next major milestone was to stay for a while and have a good look around. In other words, to orbit another world. And so, so Julie, you have sent four, or you've worked on four orbiters on four other other planets. Uh, can you talk about what's different about getting a robot into orbit and operating there for an extended period of time? versus um, just, just a spacecraft that's cruising from here to there or flying by a place? Well, the, main, the most important thing is time to go. You, if, you're, if you're orbiting, you have critical times that, where you want to take pictures or you want to not take pictures or you want to maneuver the spacecraft or not. If you're just cruising, your time to go is forever. And so you have something we're going to talk about in a minute in fall protection that you can, you can, you can be imperfect for a long time. If you have to make an encounter with a moon or a planet or take a picture at an exact time, you have to be very mindful and you have to stay in contact with that vehicle more often. Um, lots of times we let them go and not stay in contact like once a week or something like that. Um, Cassini was nine hours a day and then sometimes every other day and then every third day. So it's just a matter of uh, the critical time to go. And that's what I try to teach is time to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let, let's take a look now at the first time NASA put a spacecraft into orbit around another planet with Mariner 9 in 1971. The first great engineering challenge in robotic exploration was to fly by a destination for a brief glimpse. The next feat was to build a machine capable of going into orbit around a planet. In 1971, the very next opportunity to go to Mars, JPL had taken the idea of an orbiter from the drawing board to the launch pad. The basic spacecraft was pretty much pure Mariner, but it had this humongous propulsion module on it to slow the spacecraft down when you got to Mars to the point where it could be captured by Mars gravity. That presented some interesting challenges. You had to store propellants in space for nine months and then use them and cross your fingers and hope that everything worked the way it was supposed to. Mariner 9 became the first spacecraft ever to orbit another planet. It was a kind of epiphany in the sense of what an orbiter can do versus a flyby. The previous flybys, and it was just coincidentally, they'd flown by the uninteresting side of Mars. And when the dust cleared, we found a planet that was completely unlike the one that Mariner 4 had seen and that Mariner 6 and 7, completely. And so this planet, which we had labeled as like the moon, suddenly looked like the Earth except bigger volcanoes, bigger flood channels, a canyon that runs the distance of the United States across and is 60 miles wide in places and uh, six miles deep. The Grand Canyon of Arizona would fit in as one little tributary off the side. So we got really zapped because not only was it Earth-like, but everything was larger than the Earth. So that left us bewildered geologically, but the people who were interested in life on Mars were ecstatic because clearly there had been an aqueous phase in this planet's history. So if you uh, stay for a while and take a good look around, you're likely to see even more amazing things. So um, let's move forward a little bit further in time. Now, in 1976, NASA was ready to try landing on Mars for the very first time. This was the Viking mission, and it had two orbiters. Each of them was carrying a lander. So, Rob, uh, what is it about having a robotic spacecraft actually land itself on Mars that makes it such a challenge? Well, we like to whine about that a lot. 
Um, and I'm the top whiner. Um, uh, landing on Mars is really hard. In fact, we've, some of you have seen uh, this video, uh, uh, Seven Minutes of Terror. Uh, the seven Minutes started back in the Viking days in this Viking lander. Um, and what's uh, striking, so they're the ones, the Viking teams, the ones who taught me and my co uh, colleagues how to do this kind of stuff. And, uh, but I have to say, it is really hard. Mars is, very, is, is so irritating. There's, there's too much... Uh, too much atmosphere on Mars to land like we do in the moon just by taking a vehicle, firing its engine backwards and landing on, on its legs. And then there's, and there's too little atmosphere uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, I said that right? Job, right? Finish the job, right? Finish the job. So, yeah, so it's the atmosphere is, 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 is too, too thin. So, so to, to do it like we do on Earth with a big parachute or wings, uh, like the Soyuz or Apollo or your space shuttle. And so it has this weird combination. So you have to become, start off looking like an Earth lander, and they have to somehow, uh, tra like a transformer, convert yourself into a robotic uh, lander, um, and which is, it makes for a very Rube Goldberg design. <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's actually take a look at what that looked like. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's take a look at another video that shows uh, NASA's first attempted landing on Mars with Viking. In the early morning hours of July 20th, 1976, the Viking 1 lander separated from the orbiter and began the descent to the Martian surface. Uh, we sent spoil 5 Gs. So you have to realize this was before anybody knew about onboard software, closed loop guidance. It had to do a parachute. What a fire. The chute has been deployed. Then it had to do a terminal descent with its radar, its 4 beam radar working, and land softly. It had to go from 10,000 miles an hour to between 2 and 3 miles per hour in just a few minutes, and it had never been done before. 20 feet, 100 feet. 100 feet, 140 feet per second. So the engine started. 20 feet, 366 feet, 73 feet per second. ACS is close to vertical. Now we're coming down, straight down. Nav is green for touchdown. ACS is green, 1.5 degrees per second, max, 1.2 G's. Touchdown, we have touchdown. <laughs> A moment in every Viking's life that he or she will never forget is sitting with that television right in front of them and watching as the first lines came down. It came down line by line by line. Oh, more. a few rocks. Oh, that's beautiful. The first photograph that a human being has ever seen from the surface of another planet. Something yeah, I'm supposed to say something at this point. <laughs> I'm just, I Except just, I just don't feel like talking. Uh, <laughs> it's just, oh, it's just incredible to to see that the Mars, you know, is really there. And we all, five billion people on the planet Earth, saw Mars for the very first time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Viking w provides a really good demonstration of how our space robots have become increasingly autonomous yeah. or, or, or increasingly capable of operating on their own for periods of time. So, so what are some of the factors that have made spacecraft able to be more autonomous over the years? Well, computers. Computers? The, the ability to change from analog relays and, and hardware to digital to reprogrammable to if oops I didn't do that right I can reprogram that so a lot of it has been the computers you know better cameras faster faster data rates faster speeds uh, faster processing um, but mostly computers and right. software well, they had to enable it but we really had to do it right because because uh, sometimes you know uh, you can see you, 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 your your vehicle is on its own, and if something weird happens, the vehicle it has, has to, to take, be it has to take care you, of itself. Yeah, and so this, the, the, of course, with interdescent landing, you can't really joystick at the thing from Earth no. because it's so far away. By the time your signal gets there, you've already landed. Um, so you you uh, so you need to program it all in. 
and and in the case of landing, it's 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 a it's a bit more even more complicated than just dealing with a failure. Well, we've got a Voyager. Well, yeah. Well, it gets more. I, I wanted to, to to put a point on the not not just the the power of the computers, but it's the size too, right? I mean, the computers got smaller over well, time. Well, everything got smaller. Everything got yeah. smaller. Every, you know, everything more, got smaller. Although, yeah. if you look at the basic design, you saw those Mariners, they were six-sided, mm -hmm. and then we went to eight-sided, and then we went to 12-sided on Cassini. But the basic design, it, it builds on, on the back. You know, everything builds on. So it, you learn the lessons, and you relearn them, and you re relearn them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and part of the way to get how they got these computers small enough to do something um, to fit in those, uh, those eight-sided or 12-sided bays is that one computer, for example, would process all its information one bit at a time. Yeah. So they were they weren't processing. You know, we do now. We when our computers execute mu uh, full multi bit instructions at each time. So when you look at your phone, it says, "Oh, I'm a it's a you know t five giga gigahertz." You can open seven windows at yeah. the same time instead of you it's, can talk and now you right. can so, talk. So basically, and now you does, can talk. so to do it to add two numbers together, you had to add all the individual bits together one at a time. To 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 add the number five, you would have to add a one zero one and one at a time into the computer, and that would come back out. The, uh, with the, uh, 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 more, more bits would come out one at a time, and eventually you get the job done. So you'd have to wait an eternity for the thing to do any some calculations that you needed to do. So they learned how to multitask, essentially. Well, or to think uh, that, to keep more than one thought going. I, I, in, they weren't that smart. They I'm, were, I'm yeah. anthropomorphizing <laughs> a little too yeah. much. Okay, <laughs> they're, they're, but we well, gradually they did over time multitasking became part of it. In fact, Galileo and Cassini were two examples of missions where that we had to do this, multitasking, which means you could, with a process, better processor, now you can go, you can think a little bit about this part of the problem um, and then a little bit more on this problem. Process over right. over and, and that was true a little bit with, uh, with the, 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 the lander, uh, Viking lander. They had a very simple, very simple computer, but it was actually uh, a very a power hog back in those days. They used bipolar parts and it really screened for its day. Um, but uh, we, we couldn't fly to other stuff because it just took too much electricity. And so, uh, but when it did its job for over that short period of time, uh, it, it, was, it was first checking this sensor, then us this sensor, figuring out what calculation to make to figure out how much to change the thrusters to make sure it wouldn't tip over and, and control its velocity, take more data from the radar, the radar. And, and figure out where, where it was and say, oh, quickly, I have to change this a little bit. And would do this on a cycle of about, uh, I think, with 64 times a second. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, with the time which was considered really fast back in the 1970s. That was, that was pretty fancy. For a homemade, kind of a small, specially built computer. So there's another uh, uh, milestone on the path to smarter spacecraft, and it's something called fault protection. So can you talk a little bit about what, what that is and what it's good for? Yeah, fault protection. What you have to do is these spacecraft have to be able to take care of themselves. And that's what you were talking when you're in cruise. You can take care of yourself for a long time. The first time I heard this term was on Mars Observer, but it, it, we have what we call suncom power. So you turn, so your spacecraft, if it doesn't know where it's at, it finds, as, as Rob said, the brightest thing in the sky. And if it has solar panels, it tries to get its panels on and, on the sun. And then it tries to establish communications with Earth. So it, it, it knows in advance if Earth is over this way or over that way and to choose the right antenna for which way. And then it goes to a communication style that it just sits there and waits for, kind of waits for the earth to tell, you know, to, for us to, to call home. And then it's suncom power. And then you, you turn everything off that's not ne necessary. You're obviously, if you're in trouble and don't know where you are, you're not taking science. So you turn off unnecessary parts and then you just wait for the ground to intervene. And fault protection, that's one of the things that's gotten more and more and more sophisticated as time's gone on. So you guys have learned an engineering, an aerospace engineering term tonight. Sun com power. <laughs> and sun and com sun power. And sun communications of error, sun com power. So uh, let's actually take a look at that. Let's go back to uh, August of 1977 and the launch of the Voyager 2 spacecraft to see this kind of autonomy in action for the first time. Three, two, one. We have ignition, and we have liftoff of the Titan Centaurs carrying the first of two Voyager spacecraft to extend manned senses farther into the solar system than ever before. Voyager's programmers had taught the spacecraft that if it sensed anything unusual, to switch to backup systems. 
and that's exactly what had already occurred. Engineers call this fault protection. The fault protection started uh, doing its thing, reconfiguring the system. We're still attached to the launch vehicle. It's in the early stages of its flight, and the first thing we see are the gyros being swapped. Gyros provide a sense of balance and orientation, and Voyager 2's gyros believed something was wrong. That was because JPL engineers had not prepared Voyager for how rough a ride the launch would be. The launch vehicle, as part of its powered flight, went through a roll. And the spacecraft would never have done that on its own, so the spacecraft thought that was a fault. So it went through this whole sequence of trying things, and we thought, holy mackerel, this spacecraft looks like it's going bonkers. And we thought that we'd lost the spacecraft. Finally, we got to separate from the launch vehicle, and we were on our own, but the problems weren't over. The boom holding science instruments appeared not to have locked into place. And far worse, the spacecraft was now slowly tumbling. A last-ditch suggestion was made to stop the computer and reboot. But Chris Jones knew that then the spacecraft would be unable to lock onto the sun to properly orient itself to head on to Jupiter. And that would mean a lost mission. When I, when I heard the recommendation come from Pasadena that let's send that to air, I knew instantly that that was the wrong thing to do. Now, I had to convince people who were still mystified as to why anything was happening. But I think Glenn believed in me, as did John, that we shouldn't do that. And, and so that was the... That was the decision that was made. The Voyagers were designed to take care of themselves in the far reaches of space. No one thought the first test of its ability to survive on its own would happen in the early hours of the mission. But that is exactly what it did. After swapping thrusters, gyros, and finally the computers, Voyager 2 stabilized. Well, it's good they, they listened to that young engineer yeah. and let the spacecraft do what let, it let was programmed to do. do. That's right. right. We still try to do it that way, too. We try to, I mean, the whole idea is to train these things to, to deal with these responses. If we go around from Earth and start mucking with it, there's like, there's like, like there's having two people in charge of your robot at the same time. Exactly. And, that, and you end up with bad results when you have two people in charge, as you know. That's, a, that's, a, that's exactly right. Well, okay, so uh, uh, let's leap forward uh, another 20 years to another important milestone, which was the first rover on Mars. Uh, Rob, this really requires, you were there, let's, yeah, we've established, let's establish that. Uh, I was this off doing the big mission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I built your computers for your mission. There we go, there we go. Um, but seriously, this required a new level of autonomy and complexity, didn't it? It did, as a matter of fact. So we stole a lot of technology from Cassini project, and we stuck up with some new technology that we hadn't had before. We had some decent, some, first time, some really decent computer power and some decent computer memory, and we stuffed it into a little lander uh, for the first time, a fully centralized computing system because before they were distributed with little computers here and there um, we had to put it all in one space not because I wanted to distribute we needed it centralized just we had no room to put it we only had a little tiny space inside the a tetrahedral sh shaped Mars lander that was headed to Mars in 1997 and it landed on the 4th of July that was that was a good day around here. It was a it was good cool. day. <laughs> it was a great day. So we, 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 the irony is that we many of the technology we, we we took from stole from Cassini, we actually we got a chance to launch before Cassini did. So we got a chance to test her spacecraft. That's that's exactly true. Actually, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> well, uh, we have we have another video here of what it was like uh, here at, at NASA JPL uh, at yeah. the time that Pathfinder landed, and, and let's take a look at that dramatic moment. Friday morning. Yep. The 4th of July, 1997. DL telecom reports through stage separation. All right, this is the Mars Pathfinder flight director. We have confirmed that uh, crew stage separation has uh, occurred. 30 seconds till entry. The spacecraft is now slowing down very rapidly. We expect that the parachute will deploy in about 15 seconds.
Airbag should be inflated. So yeah. you, you, you recognize this guy. <laughs> I haven't changed, have I? <laughs> uh, no, so I, I, it's important to point out when you see these videos of, of uh, both of, of Viking, Pathfinder, Spirit Opportunity, Curiosity, all these other things that land. All these people are leaping up and it's just joy, right? No, it's relief. <laughs> it's relief. You know, because because you're having nightmares right up to the morning. What did we forget to test? What is it? I, what is it? I don't know about this gone thing. Through every path, You've gone through every protection. path. The, the fall protection, <laughs> and um, and so so interesting about Pathfinder because it's based a lot on the same the fall protection architectures and things. So so to, to, to the kinds of things that we basically adapted the architectures from. Path uh, Cassini and Voyager, uh, and gave it a little bit more smarts. It's kind of like we're adding layers of complexity on the existing architecture. Because this, this little rover, um, this lander, I'm sorry, had to fly itself to Mars, do the landing process, and open up like a flower, uh, and and begin the process of of of, um, of controlling the vehicle. But it, but unlike, uh, but, but you couldn't actually do it clockwork because. You didn't know exactly when you were going to hit the atmosphere. You didn't know exactly when to open the parachute. So it had to be more reactive with its environment. It had to sense the, uh, the deceleration of the atmosphere. It had to sense how far it was with respect to the ground, just like the Viking missions did. And those people, of course, they t taught us most of what we needed to know because we were a pretty young team here at JPL. Um, so, uh, uh, so it was, it was, but we used the same concepts and architectures that Cassini and the fault tolerance we used there used too. Um, with try, trying to meld the concept of t you know doing things on a schedule versus interacting with dynamic things that happen, events that happen. But then you still had to take care of yourself. You had oh, to yeah. make decisions that most most spacecraft that are just flying through don't, don't have, have to, to make. make. That's right. And that was all before it even uh, the little rover dro even drove off the, yeah. the, the lander. So yeah. I mean, what's the big difference in operating uh, a, a rover, a, a, a robot that has to move around versus your stationary lander? It's 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 in some sense it's that same thing on steroids. You now now it's um, you have everything you do is interactive with respect to the ground. Um, and little Sojourner, which had a little ADC-85, 8-bit microprocessor, very, very simple little machine. It, it didn't have complex software. It had simple, you know, simple behaviors, but it was, these behaviors were very close loop in the sense that it would try to drive, it would stop, it would send these laser stripes on the ground, and depending what where those stripes ended up in the ground relative to the camera pictures it would take, it would, it would deduce there was a, either a hole or a rock. And if it was a rock, it would try to turn to the left or the right and go around it if, you were if it was trying to get to destination. So it became much more of an interactive process, but it still wasn't radio controlled. It was, it was basically following a script. script. The difference is, instead of using clockwork, it had to be event driven in the sense that it would, once it would finish getting that far, the next step, not based on the clock, but based on success, would make another step and try to do the next thing in its list of things to do. And that architecture uh, is something that we had to add on a little bit to Pathfinder. We continued, that, doing, continued doing that as we added more complexity going to our next generation of rovers after that, Spirit and Opportunity. So we talked about this this before the show that, that 
Pathfinder and the missions of its era, the 90s and going forward, represented a shift in the way that robotic missions were designed, developed and built and operated, right? So, yeah, well, yeah, huge shift. A, a little bit. There's more. It's kind of the leap towards Cassini you was still a learning curve. Yeah, there, a learning oh, curve. a huge yeah. learning curve. Uh, but one of the things we talked about when we were preparing this program was how much the humans. It, it was still like cabled by the same person, and the yeah. same mechanics would put it together. So, the 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 precision and the difference between spirit and opportunity, you know, how they how they handle life differently. And and spirit was lost several years ago. So just the whole process of where you are in time and what you're facing and what you're gonna do next. That, that's right. It is built it is built up on those experiences. And there are really layers. I mean, um, although I, 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 there was a, a, a big change, it wasn't like a, a, we had to throw away the old, throw away the old to get to the new. We actually added on, add, um, very much like kind of natural evolution, where you add on the, the layers and layers of things. And we, the layers we added uh, more, uh, which really, the biggest change was not in our vehicles, but it was in our brains. Because again, we were so used to the idea of if it's 8.05 a.m. right now, I know exactly what instruction my computer, my spacecraft is running on its computer right. millions of miles away. Now it's kind of like, it's, eight, it's well, in this case, 10.30 in the morning on Mars time. Um, it should be waking up about now. Um, we'll send a list of things to do, and I hope it gets it done this afternoon. <laughs> and, and we would send the message as, as, a, as more like an email message with a list of things to do as opposed to a very prescribed script. And so, and, which is interesting because it's kind of creepy now. You don't really know if it's going to get it done. And so you have to think about, well, what happens? Well, what happens if it runs out of energy halfway through the drive? What's it do? Well, we got to program that in. It's now, it's now, now fault protection has been morphed into kind of like the kind of things that you would do as a human being taking care of yourself in normal every day. Is it really a fault that you ran out of energy because you drove too long? Not really. And when you say energy, we should really point out, I mean, one of the fascinating things about this is how little power these things run on. Oh, yeah. Cassini, Cassini had um, started out less than 800 watts and wound up 600 watts at the end of it, a half a hair dryer. I always throw that fact in. Um, and, and, you, and you were working with solar panels, so if you ran out of energy because you took too yeah. much time, you had to stop. You did, and, uh, you're, uh, and in fact, if it goes dark for a few months because there's a dust storm raging, right. you're, you're pretty much toast. I'm mean, actually not toast because it's kind of chilly. Um, uh, so your vehicle you're is deep freeze. you're kind of deep freeze. Well, good news is actually dust storms are not as cold as normally. So this vehicle, I'm actually hopeful that opportunity will come back. And please root for it for me. Um, but uh, but uh, opportunity is not is not freezing cold, but it's actually completely out of energy. It is it's it is there's virtually nothing, hardly anything left. Now gradually the light's been coming back. The sky is no longer pitch black. It's got a little. Of a, it's got enough of a glow so that the battery's charging up every day. And hopefully um, the wind's blowing, so you get some and, of that and dust. Hopefully, that's yes, right. And we, our expectation is that the dust isn't really accumulating too thickly on the solar panels. But but it is. Um, it, it just even and even big vehicles like Curiosity Rover, the big one, the size one the size of a car, um, it only operates. It only gets about a hundred watts of electricity every day. I mean, I mean, 100 watts of power all the time. Good, that's like 2,400 because Mars has a 24-hour and 39-minute day. Very convenient <laughs> for operating on this planet. It's not convenient because it's yeah, except, you've got well, you can sleep in 39 minutes every day. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I hope your spacecraft never run out of power. Thank you. Um, that's about all the time we have for our first segment here, and I think it's a great place to end, so thank you both. Thank you. Um, we have more in store, so uh, coming up after this brief video, we'll be taking a look forward into what's coming up in the future, so stick around. are inquisitive. We want to understand things. We want to understand more about our place in the, in the galaxy and our place really in the universe.
NASA has always been the leader in space exploration. In fact, NASA has been the first agency to explore each and every one of the major bodies in the solar system. It used to be that we were completely bound to the surface of the Earth. Now we actually have spacecraft that have orbited Mercury, Venus, we've been around Jupiter and Saturn, and all the way to the outer planets, all the way up to Pluto and beyond. Think about that. In 60 years, we went from just standing on the surface underneath our atmosphere, looking up, to actually visiting these places. You know, human exploration is not Star Trek. It's not go where no human has gone before. Planetary scientists actually go first. They study the body, they study the environment, they look at the risks, they look at the resources, and then human exploration with that knowledge moves out, leaving low Earth orbit, going to the moon, and then on to Mars. Obviously we want to take humans to Mars. Obviously we want somebody walking on that surface. But our current missions are helping us understand more about Mars, are helping us understand how to create oxygen, are helping us understand about the atmosphere and the wind so that we can actually have a living life on Mars. The areas that we are most interested in, where we're putting most of our resources, are the areas where there is a potential for life. So when you think about Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, and you think about Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, these are water worlds, where we're talking about entire oceans with ice shells and ultimately the question is is it possible that we could find life on those worlds that are moons of other planets within our own solar system my job is to go look and use the tools that nasa has provided so that we can learn what's out there uh, how, how does everything work the sun the earth the planets the stars all of these things are Space science for us. Galaxies, or clouds of stars, hundreds of billions of stars, are going away from us with a speed proportional to distance. Well, what made that happen? You divide the speed into the distance, you get the age of the universe. So that was the first time we knew the universe had an age. questions like where do we come from and how do we get here and the big one are we alone as much as we've learned about the cosmos there's still so much that we don't know and that's why NASA builds telescopes to answer those big questions that we haven't been able to answer yet we can do more than we've ever done before because of capabilities that exist today so the next 60 years I think is just going to be an exponential growth of our, our knowledge and understanding which is really what NASA was created for in 1958 Well, let's shift our focus now to the future. Um, we're going to spend a little time talking about how our robotic spacecraft are likely to change in the next couple of decades. So joining us now are a couple of NASA people who spend a lot of their time thinking about future spacecraft. Uh, Dr. Charles Norton works for NASA headquarters, advising the agency on small spacecraft missions and strategy. He's managed numerous small sat missions, and we'll be talking about small sats in, in uh, just a few minutes. And uh, Dr. Ann Marinen, who is a systems engineer here at JPL, she works on what we call formulation, uh, leading a team that looks at the feasibility of new mission concepts. Uh, she's also working on a couple of small sat missions right now, including one that's on its way to Mars, which she'll tell us about. So um, guys, to get started, let's talk about what new sorts of environments um, we expect to be spending our spacecraft to. Yeah, so the first panel talked a lot about you know, flying by a planet, then orbiting a planet, then landing on a planet. So now a lot of people are talking about what happens if you don't go deeper, so inside caves or inside lava tubes, or under these giant ice sheets and into oceans, or flying around on planets or moons that have atmospheres. So it's really kind of the next, one, one, one new environment is like the next step after just landing and roving around on a planet. Exactly, and these uh, environments are really introducing new types of challenges that we have to address. But what's exciting is these challenges are driven by new scientific opportunities that we want to explore. Cool. And so I'm, one of the ones that excites me the most is, 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 is crevasses and caves on the moon and things like that, so climbing robots. Um, so 
We've got a video right now that uh, provides a great example of a type of environment that we might send a spacecraft to, and that's a comet. So here's a video on the Hedgehog rover. Comets and asteroids are very fascinating places. They may contain building blocks or the remnants of the building blocks of the solar system. However, to explore, they present a unique set of challenges. There is the low gravity environment, or microgravity as we call it. For example, a person here on Earth would weigh as little as a paperclip on the surface of a comet. So a rover like Curiosity, which is currently exploring Mars, would actually only weigh a couple of kilograms. It wouldn't be able to generate much traction. And in fact, as it turns its wheels, it would probably just push itself away from the surface. It's actually quite likely to end up rotating and landing upside down, at which point it's ended the mission for the rover. So in Step Together, JPL and Stanford have been working on a totally different rover concept that is well suited to these environments, called Hedgehog. Instead of rolling around on wheels, the Hedgehog design actually puts three flywheels on the inside of a cube. By spinning these flywheels up very slowly and then very quickly applying a brake which transfers all the momentum from the flywheels, we're able to cause Hedgehog to either hop or tumble or perform small adjustments. We've done many tests here on Earth in gravity offloading test beds. Recently, we've flown two Hedgehog prototypes on a zero-g aircraft. In these tests, we demonstrated that we would be able to perform on a comet or an asteroid. Hedgehog doesn't have a right way up. Instead, it can tumble over the surface and come to rest on any one of its faces and still work perfectly. The Rosetta mission has sent back lots of very fascinating images from the surface of Comet 67P, and these images show us some incredibly rugged terrain, including large sinkholes where a traditional rover would get terribly stuck. So we've even tested Hedgehog performing a type of escape maneuver, where it spins itself up and does this tornado-like maneuver where it can actually launch itself vertically out of the sandpit. In our future work, we're looking at increasing their level of autonomy, giving the Hedgehog rovers the ability to think for himself and to navigate from one point to another. The Hedgehog rover's ability to move around on the surface of comets and asteroids could enable a wide range of applications and science in the future. Very cool uh, concept. Um, so there are clearly lots of potential destinations where you could send a robot. And even, even at a single body like the moon, there are lots of places you could go and things you could do. So um, how do you determine where you actually need a spacecraft to go um, and what capabilities it'll need when it gets there? Right. Well, you know, the scientific community has a very well-defined process that they use to try to assess what's important, um, how we should make decisions about where we want to go. And as a community, they prioritize what should be done. And there are uh, mechanisms that involve not just uh, NASA scientists, but also international partners. And as part of that, as is really shown here with the Hedgehog, um, it's a community which has a great desire to innovate. So a lot of what people are thinking about when they're looking at what are the new places we should go and the new types of missions we should develop are really focused on how can we bring you know, our ingenuity forward in a way to advance scientific objectives that the community has agreed upon. But once you do that, you have to figure out how do we really make this work? What type of studies do we have to do to trade off what's the best way of of achieving these goals. And I know, Anna, you spend a lot of time thinking about that. Yeah, yourself. so in formulation, we take these science answers or questions that we want to answer and figure out how we're going to answer them. So where do you have to go to answer the science question? Like, is there life on Mars? And so obviously, you're going to Mars. And then what kind of vehicle do you need? Or depending on what kind of question you want to answer, you choose what kind of measurements you want to make. And so then what kind of instruments you need to take those measurements? And then what does the spacecraft that brings these measurements to Mars have to look like. And if you're landing or if you're going into a new environment, what new challenges does the spacecraft have to overcome and what new capability does, it, does that have to do? Do we have the technology to do that? And then if we don't, who needs to build it and where are we going to get it? <laughs> and, and, and so the, there are a lot of these capabilities that you're talking about are, are constantly, continuously in this cycle of development and testing, and, and, and there are new ones being developed today, such as robots that can climb, um, new types of instruments. I'm sure, Charles, you, you, yes. you, you, there are a lot of, that are on the horizon that you're interested in. So um, one example that, uh, that we have here in the room of one of these exciting capabilities for the future is powered flight on another planet. And I know it sounds like science fiction 
fiction, but it's a real thing. Um, this is the Mars helicopter, and as you'll see in this video, um, uh, it's uh, slated to become reality in just a couple of years. Let's take a look. Another wow. Uh, <laughs> that's something that certainly would have seemed like science fiction when NASA was founded 60 years ago. Um, the Mars helicopter is slated to fly to Mars with the, uh, in 2020 with the next NASA rover. So let's change topics. Um, you both have done a significant amount of work on uh, what we call small spacecraft, uh, small sats and cube sats. Um, let's talk a bit about those. So, so first of all, what are they and, and what kind of role do you expect them to play going forward? Yes, well, CubeSats, it's, it's very similar to the name. Uh, you could think of a small box, which is roughly four centimeters on a side. Uh, they were developed primarily as ways for students to learn how to develop and fly space missions. Um, but what has really happened over the last few years is due to advances in consumer electronics, advances in miniaturization. Uh, people have been able to become very creative with what you can do with this type of capability. And by their very design, uh, they're very amenable to easy access to space and launch. So you now have an incredible capability to conceive of new missions, conceive of new science experiments, fit those capabilities into the small cubes or conglomerations of these cubes and make slightly larger systems, get them to space quickly, and really um, just have a, an incredible ability to think about what are the types of missions that are uniquely enabled by these systems that are, that are not so easy to do with uh, the large spacecraft that we even see around this room. Yeah, so with these small missions, you, or small spacecraft, and it's, it's not just CubeSats, it's anything basically under the size of a washing machine we consider small. Exactly. So the, so the things that you can do with these small satellites, typically they're very focused, like single, like single mind oriented kinds of spacecraft. And so they're really good for very specific technology demonstrations or flying something brand new that could be used on a larger mission or someone wants to use on a future mission, but they want to make sure it actually works in space before they fly it. So these are really good like test platforms in space in a relevant environment, basically. And you're working on just such a mission right now. I am. Yes. <laughs> so this is, it's a mini model of MARCO. So MARCO, it's, uh, it stands for Mars Cube 1, although there are two of them. And they're on their way to Mars right now, and it's, it is a technology demonstration mission. It's, there's no science payload on it. Instead, we're flying a bunch of new technologies that have never been flown in deep space before. And one of them is a radio and antenna that were developed by JPL, and one of the things we hope to demonstrate is a communications relay capability as the InSight lander, which is supposed to land on Cyber Monday, goes through its seven minutes of terror. So we can get that data back to Earth as soon as possible. And Charles, you, you have an example here of a, how a small set is also bringing another really cool new capability to the table. What's that? Exactly. I mean, right over here is a, uh, a CubeSat. It's called a 6U CubeSat because it's largely made of six of these units uh, called RainCube. So it's a, a radar in a CubeSat. And what's amazing here is it's a instrument uh, that could measure uh, precipitation profiles <laughs> through Earth's atmosphere. 
And what's really incredible about it is that a number of key technologies are brought forward to enable this capability, where many in the community thought you could never make a radar this small. You'll see this uh, umbrella-looking-like structure, which is a, uh, a mesh. Uh, what it is actually is a uh, Ka band transmitter and receiver, so we can send radar pulses through the atmosphere and through clouds, receive the signal back, and measure profiles of precipitation. And in addition, there's very sophisticated electronics and algorithms within the box that allow you to do the processing to interpret and turn that data into science. And it's just uh, an incredible capability, which was just launched a few weeks ago and has just been returning data uh, lately. And that's one of the important aspects of these small missions. You can do things rapidly. But, and, and also that they've been able to miniaturize so a, a capability that you would expect to see on a large, much larger spacecraft. In the past, exactly. you had to have a big spacecraft if you wanted to send a radar, yes, right? See, they would require large power systems, so you'd have much larger solar panels than the ones that you see here. Uh, very large antennas. And one of the benefits, again, of these smaller systems is that you can deploy many of them. So what we expect to do is to have constellations of these systems where we could have very rapid revisit and almost near real-time measurements of precipitation. Cool. Well, let's talk a bit about how spacecraft will communicate in different ways. Um, we already touched on having uh, small sats could act as communications relays, but there's this other idea of using lasers, which really interests me, uh, <laughs> instead of ra radio waves to communicate. What's that all about? So optical communication or laser communication, and so instead of using a radio, you use a laser and send data over beams of light. And so one of the advantages of that is as radio propagates just naturally through an environment or through space, it expands a lot, which is great for not really having to control where your spacecraft is pointing, because chances are if it's wide enough, you're going to get the Earth within the beam sometime. For a laser, it's much more focused. So while it's you have to point it a lot better, you can you gain all of that efficiency of having your entire beam, or at least most of your beam, encompassed. Concentrated. Or, yeah, in concentrated on your receiver. Because with the expanded signal, you lose a lot of that power propagated around it. And so if you focus most of the beam on your receiver, you can get more data back for the same power. And because it's a different frequency, it's a higher frequency than radio waves, you can also send a lot more data through. So in terms of like, what does that, it's more like Ethernet or gigabit kind of communications from space. Right now we're kind of limited to the megabit per second range. And we're talking about hundreds of megabits per second to gigabits. So it really is like a broadband. It's an enabling capability yeah. really for future mm -hmm. missions going forward. I mean, we're developing much more sophisticated instruments that take much more data, uh, that do many more tasks than we have in the past. and. You know, laser comm is absolutely going to be needed to take advantage of these uh, Yeah, and it's, 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 it's not, not just coming, it's here. We've tried it out from the space yeah. station. We've tested it out uh, from the moon with the LADI mission. We've, uh, and, and we're now sending, we're pr planning to send one to deep space with an upcoming mission called Psyche, Psyche. that's going to an asteroid. So, very cool. So, yeah, so, so uh, another, let's talk about another cool change coming to spacecraft in the future, and that is 3D printing. So uh, 3D printed parts and whole structures, how do you think that 3D printing is likely to play a role in spacecraft going forward? Yeah, again, I think it's another essential capability. I mean, with 3D printing, you really have the ability to customize very exactly the types of structures and components, and even in some cases, full systems that you would like to develop. And, you know, an important aspect of 3D printing is another capability called additive manufacturing, where as you are printing these parts and these devices, you can actually add more sophisticated components into the system and essentially um, be able to replicate very rapidly and in a very repeatable fashion, uh, fashion the types of, uh, of instruments or spacecraft of the future that we will definitely uh, want to develop. And, and it's also happening now. Well, and we have a couple of examples here that I thought were uh, pretty pretty cool. This is um, a 3D printed um, piece of what we call space fabric. This is all one one single piece here. It looks like chain mail, um, uh, but it, it's an, an example of, of something you could you could 3D print an exterior covering for a spacecraft out of a single piece. And then there's another 
Another one here, this is a, a whole, an example of printing a whole structure, a whole spacecraft structure. I think this is, this is meant to be a, a hard lander for the surface of, a, of an icy moon like Europa. But the idea being, I guess, instead of, um, instead of making multiple pieces and having to put them together, you would, uh, you would uh, print the entire structure and then you could add stuff onto it. And you, you had a cool, there was a cool footnote about that where you, you, you mentioned printing other stuff. like Yeah. So instead of just having a structure with additive manufacturing and being able to combine different kinds of materials into one structure at, the, at like simultaneously, you could build circuit boards into this structure. And so instead of having to integrate cards, you could be much more volume efficient, which is a huge thing for sending things to space, and actually build in electronics components and circuits and instruments inside the structure itself. So you could kind of print an entire spacecraft just run yeah, from, just from the, to, in one piece, in one spacecraft. Yes. Exactly. So, sorry, I guess that's that's where uh, your jobs are going to 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 robots, Robin Julie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, it sounds like um, from a lot of things we're talking about tonight that that our robots are going to need increasing levels of autonomy to do some of the things we're going to be asking of them. So are they going to keep getting smarter? How smart do we need them to be? Is there a sweet spot? Oh, they're going to keep getting smarter, and we need them to get much smarter. Uh, that's just the reality. I mean, you know, as, as we talked about even earlier in the earlier session, a lot of the missions that are developed today are very much programmed and planned in advance. We know what to do. We know what to expect. And even as we learned, we can give some flexibility to what will happen. But if we think about the missions we want to do in the future, if we want to um, look at interstellar missions, if we want to look at missions in environments where we don't completely understand where we're going and what we expect to see, we're going to require the spacecraft to do much more uh, intelligent thinking on its own. And autonomy and um, information system advances uh, are going to be essential to, to enabling that. And I foresee um, there will be great discoveries that will be produced as a result of a capability of that kind. And just putting a different spin on it, the idea of being able to reconfigure your spacecraft internally, like being able to reprogram it. Yeah, so instead exactly. of using, instead of using like a radio for specific, just for communications, what if I could do science out of it or tune it to a slightly different frequency so I can make a different measurement? So this idea of having a much more malleable internal structure of the spacecraft right. that as you make more, as you make new discoveries, you can make different measurements and have it learn and evolve based on what you see in the environment. Yeah, I mean, there's even some thought, again, turning back to 3D printing and additive manufacturing, that you may embed in the spacecraft design itself a capability for self-repair. You know, if you're in an environment where you cannot actually uh, either retrieve the spacecraft or have uh, certain types of fault tolerance that would be amenable to certain types of uh, hardware failures. So, so we're about out of time, so I, I'd like to, to wrap up, I'd like to ask you this. Are there new developments on the horizon that when you guys think about them, they really get you excited for the future? Yeah, so the thing that really excites me is it's less of a technology and more of kind of a paradigm shift. With these small satellites and its easy access to space and the accessibility of space in general for not just NASA but the entire global community, you see university students and early career people like me <laughs> um, being able to build these satellites in a year or less and learn at the very beginning of their career how difficult it is to launch things into space and actually be able to, like in grad school, I launched and was able to operate a satellite in space. And so there's this whole new generation of engineers who have this hands-on experience and have flown spacecraft that are we're building the new ones, so it's it's a huge. It's so different from how it was done before, and I'm I'm very excited about it. Yeah, and for those of us that are a little less early in their career, <laughs> uh, like me, <laughs> uh, the truth of the, of the matter is, you know, I'm used to seeing and working on submissions where we were really limited by the lift capacity of the rockets, and we are building bigger rockets. But the idea was that we would build one large spacecraft and maybe it had to make a measurement that required a large deployable system. What I see going forward is the ability of using uh, many spacecraft that are smaller, 
cooperatively, which can be used in an in-space assembly sense, where we could make very, very large systems that could make new types of measurements that are just not capable to launch from uh, the rockets that we have uh, in development right now. And, and if you think about the resilience and the robustness that can come from those systems, where if there is a failure or something you need to replace, you can simply um, replace that one section of it through another launch. It's just incredible to think about what the scientific community could conceive of with the capability of that kind. Absolutely fantastic. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Well, remember, when it comes to the role of the robots, they're an extension of us. And with their help, just imagine what we can accomplish in the next 60 years. So thank you to all of our panelists tonight, and uh, thanks, to all, thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, remember, you can find out more about how NASA explores at nasa.gov. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, and we'll go to uh, set up for Q&A here in just a second, and we'll take your questions. So uh, there's a microphone uh, uh, in the center uh, of the aisle. Please step up to that. Trusting your head to the lectern. Yep. Okay, it looks like we're getting some questions queued up here. I'm glad you guys have some, some good ones ready for us. We'll also be taking some questions from the folks watching on uh, live online on uh, YouTube and Facebook and uh, uh, I let everybody join the conversation here. So if you guys are ready, <laughs> we'll take our first question. Hi there. Hi. Um, I was wondering if, is this on? Okay. I was wondering if there's a potential for uh, virtual reality integration for the Mars helicopter because I feel like maybe if you are able to, at your age, uh, be able to have a spacecraft, then maybe anyone anywhere on, in the world can be part of the process. Is that for me? Are you any one of us? I, I'd be happy to try. Um, so, the, the VR experience you can do. I mean, the, the, we've been trying to do this. For example, um, uh, our rovers collect a high-resolution stereo data uh, imagery, and from the stereo pairs, we can, can reconstruct the shape of the surface. And here on Earth, we can either don, uh, don uh, 3D goggles and look around and kind of walk around as if you're on Mars, um, or just even you know, just even look and, and, and play with it with one eye and, th and, and on a normal computer screen, um, but uh, but the helicopter it has the same problem with almost all of our stuff is the, that the that the whole helicopter flight is over in just a few minutes, and then the imagery we do get back and not a lot of it's video. Um, it takes a while for that to come back, and so you're not it's not an immersive environment when it's happening. Now on the other hand. You can do what you said. You can, act, but you can by visualizing in advance. We can create models of, from the three-dimensional terrain. We can imagine it and, and 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 have the computer generate a prediction of the flight that we've designed for that might be be planned for tomorrow, and see how it goes. Just like we do when we drive the rover, we actually drive it in advance. You know, pretend like you're figure out where you want it to go, and see it in 3D, and then those be 
the things that we see become the very instructions we send to the vehicle the next morning and, or to the helicopter the next day. So it's close, but it's not, it doesn't have that kind of intuitive reaction. After the fact, or even before the fact, we could share that information, and so you could actually see what that flight was, what, either what it looked like or what it's going to look like through a simulated flight of the helicopter. Does that make sense? So yeah. So yeah, and and, and there, remarkably, there are apps you can we, we have you can do it today. You can do it today. You can actually go look and see in 3D and see what's going on uh, on Mars. It's really cool. What? On other planets, too. On other planets? Cassini? <laughs> yeah. You, Yay. Oh, you could fly through the, the rings the, of Saturn. The first Eric de Jong um, yes. going over Venus. Oh, yes, yeah. Let's take a minute. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Hi. So um, I'm wondering, uh, in the next, in the coming years uh, for robotics at NASA, will, robot, will robots like have a broader role in addition to just exploring? So maybe like have construction robots land on Mars and start building a little house so that when humans get there, there's like something, there's a place to live. Kind of thing. So <laughs> is, is that like a possibility or is, do you see that as some, something uh, robotics at NASA could take in the future? Oh, it's on the future half of the table here, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I don't make NASA policy, but the, the, I mean, that's definitely a role that robots could do and would be well suited to, is instead of sending people to have to build their own habitats for them send exploring kind of the same way that there were pathfinders to the moon and to Mars kind of understanding the environment in preparation for a human mission it would make sense to do something like that where a robot would go ahead of time and kind of set the stage and put a lot of things in motion so that the, by the time the humans got there there was an infrastructure already in place so yeah, we have some aspects of that happening now there are missions that are going to launch um, with the uh, SLS mm -hmm. in a couple of years, which uh, their whole goal is to address some of these uh, strategic knowledge gaps that will pave the way for human exploration. Uh, for example, looking for resources and consumables in the lunar environment. And you could imagine that going forward, um, as other capabilities are developed, um, you know, such as the Lunar Gateway and other uh, systems, that you would want to have the capability to have uh, robots interact with humans and to provide those types of uh, environments in a way that would be beneficial. And, and in fact, the d design reference missions, uh, the, many of the, the human design reference missions that NASA has been studying, um, have a robotically controlled uh, system landing in advance before humans get there, where it actually does uh, in situ resource utilization, where it actually processes the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, takes the C from the O2 of the CO2 atmosphere and creates oxygen. Uh, and so there, there are ways of doing that with robotically. Um, it doesn't actually look like, like an R2-D2 kind of rover vehicle doing it. It looks like a machine that's just sitting there going doing that work and processing it. But, or, but, but, but when the astronauts get there, they will have this resource there already prepared and ready for them to, to use on their mission. So do you see robots doing more kind of uh, manipulation of space in the future? So like pushing asteroids around or like yeah, like drilling that. into moons and things like that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They could do it. <laughs> um, something I'm curious about is you're, you're talking about how uh, earlier craft would use stars for navigation, but also that they didn't really have digital cameras or computers. So how could they see around and figure out enough about navigation with stars to actually use and see any information from the stars. So, so what it what they did was um, uh, like Voyager has a, a tracker that looks at Canopus. the Canopus star, which is a south bright southern star, and if the vehicle starts drifting away from it like this, uh, the sensor will say, "Hey, your the star is moving to the left." Oh, so it, it basically has to either use its reaction wheel or its, or its, its thrusters to go t -t 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 push it back in. The rover doesn't, I mean, the, the, the vehicle doesn't really know its orientation. You can't ask it, but it, but it has this simple behavior that effectively puts it in the right orientation space. Later on, Galileo and then Cassini, we added the capability where the vehicle actually says, hmm, I know those stars. I recognize that. St I have a star map. And so they actually keep a star map and they go, yeah, I know where I am. They, they do. They do now. They are cameras, 
But even uh, like 1989, Magellan used a, basically a, a sextant. <laughs> you know, we went out and looked at one star, and then we looked at another star, and and navigated like the ancient mariners. Yeah. You know, now they were they were cup. You know, but they were comparing them with the brightness of a star, and then every once in a while. Uh, it would swallow a bad star because yeah, it would a get lot. a, a <laughs> <That's> lot. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, the newer ones are, are star scanners now. And if you know you're, you're going to blind the star scanner, or uh, yeah, like with bright objects like the sun, then you tell it to stop and go on gyros for a while. Right, and, and these vehicles know their orientation, know their but it wasn't until Cassini that we actually had a vehicle that actually had, it knew where it was around the sun and where Earth was. So that was a very gradual development. Um, it, 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 so we, we've gradually added more intelligence to the vehicle, so more self-awareness of what its own state and where it is in the solar system. So those early sensors were almost like a digital camera with just a few little they, pixels. They are. They yep. are. They are digital, they're digital cameras. They're CCDs. That take um, that, that run through pictures, and then they'll look for the the brightest stars in a star map, and they'll match up three best or five best. Juno does that as, as it's going, even as it's rotating today. That's the way it, it knows yeah. where it's at. And now they and make them that are this big. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're both jumping at the bit to yeah. say yeah. that. This is it, I know. <laughs> if you look at the spacecraft over here, that whole integrated avionics system, the star tracker, the maps, the computer, the telescope, the baffles, all of it is about the size of my fists <laughs> now inside that. Basically. Thanks for your question. Cool, thank you. Hi, so I know that every rover has to be specifically suited for its environment. Like when you're building a rover, uh, do you go off one design and then just modify it to suit it for the environment or do you just completely start from scratch? Oh, great question. We just don't Mariner, Mariner, uh, we try not to start from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, and, and one of the things that we've never been able to do completely at JPL, we tried to do it with the Mariner program. We tried to do it with Mariner Mark. Mar you know, Mariner Cassini was supposed to be uh, Mariner Mark three. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. and we were and we were going to two. Yes. Yeah, Mariner two. Mark Mariner, two. Mariner Mark two. And which it was going to be have our, one of our, our historian here in the audience. So. <laughs> yeah. Yay! We we knew Eric would so come through. Checked. Um, but. <laughs> It's it's sort of like my, I always compare it to trying to build a street trail bike. You either got a street bike or you got a trail bike. You haven't got a street trail bike, so you, they are adaptable, but only within certain constraints. Yeah, I mean, almost all of our vehicles you'll recognize the previous heritage inside the next one, and NASA doesn't like us to start over. It's expensive. So, so we'll, we try to adapt. To use parts. We try to use it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, well, yeah. Uh, Cassini flew Voyager thrusters that were, you know, already 20 years old at that point, and they were Apollo uh, vintage. Yeah. The main, the main engine was an Apollo thruster. That's right. The thruster that they had on the on the side of the lunar module. Right? On the lunar module, yeah. right? That's correct. So let's uh, let's. Uh, did you have a follow up? No. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's Great take question. a. Let's, thank you for your question. Let's take a, uh, a question from, uh, from social media, actually. Um, I'm actually going to combine this into a twofer because I think they're related. So uh, this will be Temple Cave from YouTube who asks, will future robotic missions have equipment to detect evidence of mo microbial life? And then that's, that goes along with David's uh, question from Facebook where he asks, how do you ensure that you don't spread Earth-based bacteria to other worlds? They are connected, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sort of. Uh, <laughs> well, you want, you should want go first. I, well, my, my wife happens to work at JPL. She's in a group called the Planetary Protection Group. Oh, and <laughs> in fact, that is their role, to ensure that we do not forward contaminate um, uh, places where we might land spacecraft and also backward contaminate the Earth from spacecraft that we would uh, return. And it's taken very seriously. Actually, I think going back to the um, Apollo days, there were rules that NASA established uh, for planetary for, protection. Yeah. In fact, we, we, uh, even the early Ranger spacecraft that JPL built, uh, that was supposed to go to the moon, uh, and we aimed it multiple times. So there was uh, right on this stage, um, six of them failed. 
one after another, month uh, month after month, for different, for different reasons, uh, we finally got there. But, there. but one of the reasons we thought we may have, they may have failed them was because we were cooking the whole spacecraft uh, at uh, 120, 25 degrees centigrade. And the, the, a lot of people felt that that was actually just too much for poor electronics to take. Um, but we killed the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> The, the other part of the question is about detection of life. Um, on the, it's really, really hard for us to detect. I mean, it's hard to detect life on this planet. I mean, unless it's sitting in the room waving at you. Um, but if it's microscopic and it's very, very tiny, it's very, very hard to deduce, uh, especially if it's not alive, whether or not it's actually or, or truly an organic structure or some sort of uh, uh, remnant other structure from some geomorphic phenomena that actually occurs. In fact, there was an asteroid that came back uh, in 84. I mean, actually, it wasn't 84. It was found in, uh, in Antarctica, ALH 84001. Uh, it landed on Earth about 13,000 years ago. It had been in orbit around uh, the sun for several million years and had been kicked off. Before that, it was kicked off of Mars. And so people thought, hey, maybe there's life there. And, and, and it turned out there's complex, very complex um, quasi-organic structures uh, that, uh, that were very reminiscent of life. But even then, we struggled in labs here to figure it out. So, so we don't really have a way yet to detect life on another planet very easily, other than what Viking tried to do, where he actually pours, you know, pour goop in there, and you kind of hope that the stuff, you give it food, ferment. and then it starts to ferment, and then you go, what's that smell? And so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's very difficult to detect. Cool. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I uh, had a question. I was wondering whether or not uh, the remote, uh, 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 remote, uh, <laughs> I have metal block, I'm sorry. Uh, the re, uh, remote manipulator system will increase its function uh, beyond that of uh, grappler assembly, uh, anchoring the uh, uh, spacemen that are doing the space work like the uh, astronauts. So you, are you asking maybe, uh, are, are, are we going to see additional capabilities beyond yes. the basic moving around? Uh, yes. Well, I think there, there, is, an, there is this idea, of the, uh, or there's, uh, Robonaut, and then there are a variety of other, of other well, systems on the space station. So it's very, very dependent on the application. They're not making generic ones. Um, for example, uh, we made a, you know, our robotic arms on our rovers, for example, are getting bigger and bigger and heavier, mostly because we're adding more tools to the end of the arm. The whole the rover is going to go clunk. It's so heavy. Um, big chunk of stuff. So we've added, we've added science instruments, um, and, and all sorts of things are being bolted to the end of these robotic arms. But they're just the same, conceptually, the same multi-degree of freedom robotic arms that you see uh, in, uh, in robots that you can buy in catalogs here on this planet, um, architecturally. Um, but we have, but but really, so the application of the effector, end effector, is really dependent on what it is you want it to do for a living. And so, uh, in our case, um, uh, the one that's being built right now and just a few hundred feet from here will be integrated into our clean room uh, for the Mars 2020 mission. It's got is a is a the the hand of this robotic arm is about this big, and it's just chock full of instruments. Uh, a coring drill system, a, a, uh, a, uh, a dust removal tool, basically blowing air on the dust, or the, to move dust on rocks. It's got sensors, it's got cameras. It's just chock full of stuff. So I, I would say it's very dependent on what, you're, what it is, the problem that's being, trying to, being solved. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. So um, I've heard that Mars is called Earth's sister, like, because mm -hmm. of it's almost the size. Do you think that since it's almost the same size, that it may have a good enough atmosphere to to sustain to sustain life? Hmm. 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 It's not. It's a distant sister. Distant sister. It's a, it's a distant sister. <laughs> an old yeah, sister. an old sister. A very old sister. Very it's, old um, sister. So Mars has an atmosphere only one percent of the thickness of our planet. So it would be the same, if you were to somehow go up uh, 130,000 feet above sea level, which is many times higher than Mount Everest, that's how thin the air is. And guess what, it's not oxygen. Why? Because there's no plants to make oxygen. 
So it's just carbon dioxide. So uh, the interesting thing is, well, could Mars eventually have life? I mean, with atmosphere. It's certainly there's plenty of evidence that it did have a substantial atmosphere billions of years ago. Uh, but we think today, uh, I mean, certainly not today. You need a space suit and a, and a warm jacket and air. Uh, and make sure you bring thick sole shoes because our wheels get torn to shreds. And so you've got to, as we, sharp rocks. Um, so, uh, our, uh, uh, so Mars is, is not that hospitable today, but we could make it so um, and, and so, and, and in certain ways. We can bring our atmosphere with us. We can live under dome cities or dome towns. So we can actually do that on Mars. So it could be a friendly place. And the best thing, you only weigh one-third as much. So you'll be able to jump in some great basketball hoops, I can tell you. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have uh, for tonight. So thank you to everybody who, who uh, brought, brought their questions. Uh, thank you to everybody for watching online and for, for submitting your questions. Sorry we didn't have time to get to everybody. But uh, we always love having you guys here, and we're so glad that you joined us. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>